Well, good morning and welcome to the Grove. Let's get up for JT and the worship team. That was awesome. I was all jacked up to preach this morning, and JT made me cry, so that's awesome. Thanks, JT, for that. It's a bunch of kids. <laughs> well, good morning. If you don't know who I am, my name is Tyler, Pastor Tyler. Uh, I'm the executive pastor here. Um, help with students do. Uh, adults, a bunch of stuff. I get to preach every so often, so I get to preach today, and I'm excited about it. Um, I like my message uh, this morning. It speaks to me a lot, um, so I'm excited to get to share it. Phil will be back this week, uh, so I'll be back next week uh, preaching on Sunday, so make sure you're here for that. Uh, we saw those kids just now. A lot of them had this shirt on. I'm wearing a blazer today. They're like, why are you so dressed up? This is not a blazer. They had a clean, and I didn't want to preach in a t-shirt, so I kind of like made myself look a little better, at least a little presentable. You know, my mom was here, so I didn't want her to get mad at me. So I wore the blazer. But we had the children's lock in on Friday. Um, and, and if you have a child and they were there, so um, if you didn't, it was awesome. You missed it. There was two salvations, uh, which is awesome. Praise God. Yeah. But my sister, she, she's crazy. Like, I'm crazy. I'll do some crazy stuff. But she took 53 kids from kindergarten to fifth grade and stuck them in this church. And they survived. I, don't, I mean, I, I'm not great. Like, children, I love children, and children like me, but I'm, I'm like, I'm a disruptor, right? So when I get your child, I don't have children yet, so when I get your child, I, like, get them all crazy and jacked up, and then I'm like, here you go, give them right back to you, you know, because that's me, and, and I'm probably always going to be like that, I guess, so pray for my wife whenever we do have children. But that's what I did. I showed up on Friday, and there were 50-something kids, and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. And so I, I took my dog out there, and I was disrupting everything, and I know Caitlin was ready to kill me, so I didn't stay long. Uh, but it was awesome. 53 kids, two salvations. Uh, man, so that was crazy, crazy Friday and Saturday. I don't think they slept much, but if your kid was there, uh, I'm sure they enjoyed it. They were having fun when I was there. Um, so, yeah, that happened this weekend, and then uh, now we're here on Sunday, and you get to hear me preach. So I'm excited. So this morning, where we're going to be uh, is First Kings. All right, so if you have your Bibles, you can go to 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, 19. I'm really going 16 through 19, but 18 and 19 is kind of where we're going to start at. So if you have, have your Bible, you can go there. So we, uh, Phil's been doing a, a series called Courageous, and uh, we were going to circle back and do a, a series on prayer uh, right now. And then he kind of jumped the gun and did prayer last week. And I was like, well, I'm still doing prayer. He's like, I right, just do your own thing. Okay. So I'm on Elijah. That's where I'm going to be at to, to this morning, uh, 1 Kings. And... I was looking at Elijah, and, and, and I was listening to a podcast that uh, one of my friends sent me, and I was listening to it, and uh, as I was listening to it, he made a statement in it just before he even got started in, in his sermon, and in his, in his talking, and I was like, man, that's good stuff about God being in all situations, the good, the bad, whatever situation that you're dealing with right now, currently, presently, as you're sitting there, the situation in your life, God is there, right? And I was thinking about that, and I was like, man, that's pretty powerful, so I started thinking about, and, and what I went to in my mind was Elijah on Mount Carmel when he brought fire down from heaven, and uh, burned up uh, the, the altar and all the water. And I was like, man, that's, that's good. So I started reading on that. That was about two weeks ago. So I've been reading on Elijah. And as I was reading Elijah, I was just reading the whole story, just trying to take it in, trying to figure out where God was leading me to, to talk about this Sunday. And as I was leading, reading Elijah, it hit me that God, the, the people that God uses in Scripture are just like us, right? They got highs and they got lows. They go through valleys. They have sin that they're dealing with. They have different struggles that they're dealing with. Obviously, they don't have iPhones and different things like that, but they got different problems, the same problems that we're dealing with in the present day. So when you look at Elijah, and you look at these people, the ones that do something incredible for God and we get to read about and, and talk about, the only difference between them and us is when they were afraid, they took a step out in faith, right? And we let fear stop us. We let, we let fear keep us comfortable and not take risks in our life. And so, so this morning, as I'm looking at Elijah, as, as I've been reading Elijah, I was thinking about uh, spiritual highs and spiritual lows. How if you walk with Jesus, if you know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, right? You have been set free, and when you die, you're going to heaven, right? You've accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. But there are times in your walk with Christ when you're trying to live a holy life or do what God's called you to do, where you get in a spiritual valley. You're dry. And how do you get out of that? What does that look like? The people go through that, and, and I'm here to say everybody goes through that. You get discouraged. You, lo you lose your courage. You, you become afraid. So if you take notes, I want you to write this down before we get started. I want you to think about it. 
Where are you at currently spiritually? Your spiritual walk with Jesus, your relationship with Christ, where's it at right now? Is it in a good place? Is it in a bad place? Are you in a valley right now? Are you spiritually dry? Are you struggling? Or are you in a good place with your relationship with Christ and you're trying to do what God has called you to do because everybody in here has a calling for their life. God has ordained your steps. God has a plan and a purpose for you. <clears throat> and sometimes we miss out on that purpose. Sometimes we get in valleys and we run from our purpose. We run from what God's called us to do. Do you ever feel discouraged? This guy Elijah, his name means my God is Yahweh. Right? That's pretty cool, right? My God is Yahweh. The God we serve is Yahweh. He's the true God. That's Elijah's name. Elijah was a prophet for God uh, during, the time, during the time where Israel was going the wrong direction. Right? Going the wrong direction. You had King David uh, did good things for, for Jesus. And then you had uh, his son Solomon who tried to do good things. But ever since then, man, it just started going downhill. And they were living in sin, worshiping idols, worshiping different people, worshiping different things, not living for God. And it was showing. It was showing. So then you get Elijah to step on the scene. Elijah is this incredible prophet for God, and he performed 14 miracles that the Bible speaks up. And he starts in uh, 1 Kings chapter 17 is when you first see Elijah on the scene. But where are you at spiritually right now in this moment in your life? Where are you at spiritually with God? Where's your spiritual life? Is it where you want it to be? I'm going to go ahead and say it's probably not, right? For anybody in here, even if you're doing good things for God, I mean, you can always work in your spiritual life, right? Or maybe you're in here and you're in a valley right now and you're struggling and you're trying to get back in it. You're trying to get back in the game, trying to figure out what God has called you to do, but you, you don't know how to get there. So Elijah, when we, where we're going to read is kind of in the middle of the story. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to take a journey of Elijah's life. But what I'm going to read, uh, first off, is kind of in the middle of this journey. Okay? Bear with me. So follow along while the scripture on the screen. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 46. <clears throat> the last verse in chapter 18. The Bible says, And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So the hand of God is on Elijah right now. In this last verse. Verse 1 of chapter 19, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Listen to this. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. I'm no better than my father's. How did Elijah, the main prophet of God, the guy, the guy that's been doing just incredible miracles for Christ, seeing, seeing God just show up in miraculous ways in his life, which we're going to look at in a second, how does he get to this point in his life? How does he get here? How does Elijah get to this point where he's ready to give up? He's ready to throw in the towel, ready to quit, ready to say, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired. I'm hurt. I've been broken. I thought I was doing good, and this happened. Like, what do I do, God? Where do I go from here? Maybe that's you this morning. You're trying. You've been coming to church. You're trying to lead your family the right way. You're trying to lead your wife the right way. You're trying to, to get your kid or your, your, your daughter or your son in church, but they keep going down the same path and they won't show up. You're trying. You're trying. You don't know what to do, and you're ready to give up. And that's where we find Elijah in this moment. He's ready to give up. He's ready to call it quits. He's about to walk into a valley, walk into the desert. You ever stop thinking about your life, like how, did, how, how you got to this point in your life? Like when I was younger, I, yeah, I, you don't think about in the future very much, right? You think about like when you're a kid, you're like, I'm going to be an NBA basketball player. That's what I'm going to be. And then I realized I'm not doing that. And, and you had these, these big dreams because you don't, you don't really think about it. You don't really think it through. And then you're thinking about Friday night. You're thinking about the weekend, what you're going to do this weekend. As you get older, you start thinking more like about the future and different things. And uh, you, you ever stop and just think like, how did I get here? What am I doing? Like, this is weird, right? The other day I was uh, um, in Athens. Uh, last Thursday, I was visiting somebody that goes to this church who was in the hospital, and I was sitting in Athens, Tennessee, eating lunch, and I've, I've been reading about Elijah and thinking about it, and so I was thinking to myself, this is kind of weird. I'm 27 years old in Athens, Tennessee, just visited a hospital that 
is not a very great hospital. I don't know if from Athens. I would go somewhere else. But the, at this hospital, I'm, I'm there, and, and, and I'm just visiting, and I'm sitting here eating, and I'm like, that is kind of weird. I didn't know Athens was a city 10 years ago. Never even heard of Athens. Never would have thought at 27 I'd be eating at a cookout in Athens, you know. But that's where I was, and I'm like, it's kind of weird how I got to this point in my life. Like, what is going on? And so, so, so God puts you in different places in your life, and a lot of times he has a purpose for you, he has, has reason for you to be there, and he's called you to do something for him. He's called you uh, for a purpose. He's ordained your steps. So this morning as we look through Elijah, it's, we're looking at a three-year journey, okay? A little over a three-year journey of Elijah's life and how he wound up in this moment where he was running for his life, running away, ready to call it quits uh, for God. I was talking about one of my leaders uh, uh, about being in a valley and, and how you get that way. When you're doing ministry and, and you're trying to do what God's called you to do and you get discouraged. It's easy to get discouraged in ministry. It's easy to get discouraged in trying to do what God's called you to do, try to live a holy life, because sin is so easy to creep up in your life or sin is so easy to creep in somebody you love's life and, and you see it and it breaks your heart, right? And you get discouraged. Like, why am I even doing this? Like, what else am I supposed to do? Where else am I supposed to go? What else? We, get, we have these highs and we have these lows. And I was looking at Elijah. He had the same thing, man. He had high spiritual highs and spiritual lows where he was doing something great for God and all of a sudden he was at the lowest point in his life. And how do you get back out of that? How do you get back out of that? How do you get back on the mountaintop with God? Go from being a valley to, to, to doing more. So you see, see, see salvations. We'll have baptisms, and you're all fired up. Everybody's excited. Like, yeah, kids are coming to know Jesus. And then you go through a spell, spell where, man, they're not even coming to church. It's like, what, what else do I do? What else do I do? All right, so some backstory about Elijah, all right? So we know what we've read so far is Elijah's about to run away because he's scared because of this woman named Jezebel and King Ahab, and, and he's running for his life. He's ready to call it quits. He's ready to be done. So how do we get to here? How did Elijah get here? 1 Kings uh, chapter 16, verse 30 says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. If you want to be known for something in the Bible, it's not this, right? <laughs> you were evil. You did more evil than the people before you. You were not a good dude. And that's where Ahab is. Ahab reigns over Israel for 22 years. The Bible says he's there for 22 years. And then you have Jezebel. His wife, he marries Jezebel. Jezebel was not a good lady. If you have been called a Jezebel, that is not good. I didn't know that was a thing, but apparently it is. So don't, I don't know if you've been called a Jezebel. I'm not calling you a Jezebel. I'm just, that, people say that, I guess. Um, but that was Ahab's wife. I heard a preacher say one time he was preaching about Ahab and Jezebel, and he said, the last decision Ahab ever made was I do, because Jezebel ran his life. Ahab did whatever Jezebel said. Ahab wanted a piece of land one time, which we're not going to get to there. He wanted a piece of land one time, and he went crying to his wife, and his wife goes, don't worry, I'll get you that piece of land, and went and stoned the guy. Like, she ran the thing. So, so Jezebel, you don't want to be a Jezebel, just don't be a Jezebel. So Jezebel worshipped a god called Baal, all right, the god of lightning, the god that, that, that brought the rain and the lightning. That's, that's the, the god that she worshipped. And so because of that, Ahab was like, I'll worship him too. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So Jezebel... Worship Baal. Worship Baal. She ordered the killings of all the prophets of God, of Yahweh, of our God, the God we serve. There's only about 150 left. Elijah was one of them, but this guy named Obadiah, which we won't look at him today either, but Obadiah saved. He would hide 50 of them at a time in different caves. Try to save them. <coughs> because he still feared uh, God. So you got Jezebel and you got Ahab. They're ruling. They're bad people. Not good people. And then you got Elijah. First time you see Elijah in Scripture, uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. We got it up here too. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. So the first time he steps on the scene, he goes to this king who's killing off all the prophets because of Jezebel, because they worship Baal, and he says, Listen, he turned off the rain. He said, it's not going to rain or do until I say so. He turned off the rain like we turn off the shower. Like that, that's how much power he had in this moment because God is with him in this moment. First thing you see him do, it ain't going to rain until I say so, to the king who stands opposed to God. 
That's strong. It's the first thing you see about him. First time, he says, no more rain till I say so. Till I say so. Really, till God tells him. So he tells him, till I say so. No more rain. That's a bold statement. But because God ordained it, it was true. It was no rain and no dew. And so King Ahab is not happy, clearly. Obviously, he would be pretty upset if he's the king and there's no rain and uh, they got livestock and a bunch of people under them. They got to feed and, and, and have them food and water. Um, so they're pretty upset. So God takes Elijah. All right, so he's already turned off the rain. Chapter 17, verse 1, he's already turned off the rain. Then God gives him more instructions to survive the drought and survive from Jezebel, right? 1 Kings 17, 4 through 6, listen to this. He says, you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. So not only did he turn off the rain, he got room service from some ravens. I mean, that's what happened. I mean, you should read your Bibles. It's incredible. Like, there's some cool stories. So he takes him away to this brook. God, God leads him there, and, he, and he, he, he lays there. He sleeps there. That's where he's living. He's got water right there, and he's got ravens bringing him food. God is showing up just incredible in this guy's life. God is providing for him when there's no hope. There's no, there's no food. There's a drought. There's people coming after him, trying to find him. Jezebel wants to kill Elijah, right? You ever get that way in your life where, you, where you're going through stuff and you got a big decision to make or you're struggling with your finances, you don't know how you're going to pay that, and then all of a sudden God comes through in a miraculous way, and you're like, oh, my God. Like, that's incredible. God shows up in your life and provides for you in that moment. That's what Elijah just happened for him. He showed up with some ravens. I've never had ravens bring me food. It'd be kind of weird, but God shows up in your life in different ways. We had our Easter offering a couple weeks ago, and, and I've heard stories of uh, different people that, that gave above and beyond, and, and they called me and said, you're not going to believe this. Right? I was worried about what I was going to give, and I gave more than I thought I was going to give, and, and then God showed up in this way. God provided this for me and my family. God provided this in my life. And I could get up here and tell stories about my own life where I've been in sticky situations or uh, tough decisions I had to make or my own finances, and God just showed up in an incredible way. When you step out in faith, God provides. God provides for you. Elijah's stepping out in faith, goes up to the king, says, no more rain, and God provided for him. Brought ravens. <clears throat> These moments happen to us all the time. Next, when the brook dried up, later on in, in chapter 17, uh, the brook dried up. So God said, all right, next you're going to go to this widow's house, and the widow is going to feed you and give you drink, and you're going you're gonna to stay there for a while. So he's like, all right. And he gets up, and he goes, and he gets to this widow, and he sees the widow and says, hey, uh, what do you have there? She's got flour and a jar of oil. And he said, uh, make me some food, make me some bread, and, and give me something to drink, and uh, it'll be good. And the widow, there's a drought in this, this land. The widow goes, I can't do that. I only have enough for me and my son for this day. I, mean, I, I can't give you something too. And Elijah says, no, you can. God's going to provide. I'm with, I'm with Christ. I'm with God. Yahweh said, make me something first, and there'll be some left over. And so she does that. She goes and she makes uh, Elijah bread and, and gives him something to drink. And the Bible says the, the whole time he was living with this widow, she never ran out of food and never ran out of drink when she only had enough for that day. God's showing up again in his life. A short time later, the widow's son dies. The Bible says he became ill and the breath left his body. And the widow comes to Elijah and says, I thought you were with God. What happened? Why did this happen to me? And he goes, hold up. He takes the son up to the upper chamber, and he prays over him three times over. He said, God, give, give this breath back to this boy. And that's what God does. The boy comes back to life. Uh, chapter 17, verse 23 and 24 says, And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. God is showing up incredible ways in Elijah's life. Incredible ways. Turned off the water. Ravens brought him food. The widow never ran out of food or drink. And then the kid got brought back to life. I mean, if you're Elijah, you're like, Whew, I can do anything with God. Like, you believe that in your life. In that moment, he's believing this. So much so that what he does next is incredible. 
So for three years, God kept him alive during this drought. He kept him alive during this drought. Now God tells him to go to Ahab. Go back to Ahab. It's time. The time has come. So he goes back to Ahab. And uh, first thing Ahab says, this is in uh, uh, chapter 18. The first thing Ahab says is, is that you, troublemaker? Because obviously they haven't had rain for three years. And he goes, I ain't a troublemaker. You are. You're going between God and Baal. Stop, going, stop being on the fence. Stop lipping between two opinions. If God is God, serve God. If God's not God, serve whoever. He said, but God is God. He says, so much so that I want you to get 450 of your best prophets of Baal, and I want you to bring them on top of Mount Carmel. He said, bring them to me. So Elijah, okay, who they're trying to kill, they've already killed all the prophets. Obadiah uh, is the one that brings Elijah to Ahab, and he's afraid for his life now. He's like, he's going to kill me, and then he's going to kill you. And Elijah said, no, he's not. Let's go. And he goes to Ahab and says, bring 450 of your best prophets. You need to read this story for yourself. I can't go through it because I get through my message. <clears throat> but he brings the 450 prophets uh, with them uh, up on Mount Carmel. So he's on Mount Carmel. Okay, that's important. I want you to remember that, Mount Carmel. And he gets on Mount Carmel and he says, here's what we're going to do. He says, it's Elijah, verse 450. He said, we got these two bulls. We're each going to take a bull. We're going to make an altar to, you're going to make an altar to your God, Baal. I'm going to make an altar to my God. And we're going to say who uh, brings fire down from heaven. Because he's playing in their hands because Baal's the god of lightning, right? So he's going to bring lightning down. He says, I'll bring fire down. So he said, we're going to see, see who gets it done. So he gets up there. He gets 450 prophets, and he lets Baal's uh, prophets go first. And they, they take their, their offering. They put it on the altar, and they cry out to their god. They're crying out to Baal. They're saying, God, or Baal, show up. Show up, Baal. Uh, come on, come on. So much so from morning to noon, they're crying out to God. And Elijah is so confident in who Jesus Christ is in his life that he starts to mock them. He's so confident that God's going to show up in his life that he's not worried about the consequences. He says, uh, why don't you yell louder? He's probably in the bathroom. I didn't make that up. That's in the Bible. It says he's relieving himself. You should probably speak louder. He said, maybe he's on a journey. He, he's gone away. You need to yell louder. Maybe he'll come back home and help you. Maybe he's asleep and you need to yell louder to wake him up. He's mocking these prophets. They continue to go. They're crying out. They start cutting themselves. They're trying to do anything they can to get Bell to to, to do what they think that Bell can do, and it never happens. And Elijah goes, my turn. Come near. So they come near to him. They come near to him, and he says, here's what we're going to do. He builds an altar with 12 stones, the 12 tribes of Israel. <clears throat> he builds the altar, and he puts the bull on top of it. And he says, this is what we're going to do. I know there's a drought, but here's what we're going to do. I want you to go fill those jars up with water, and I want you to pour it all over the altar. So he does it. He says, after they do it the first time, he says, do it again. After they do it the second time, he doesn't do it a third time. Now, during the time uh, just before this, previous to this, Ahab and uh, Obadiah are going out to the land trying to find any green grass because there's no water, and they're trying to survive this drought. And he's making them get the water they do have and dump it on this altar. And they do it because they want Elijah to fail. But Elijah knows he's going to come back. And I'm not, I'm not like a, an outdoorsman. Like, I can't start a fire. I'm not a I don't know. I know you put gasoline on it and just, you know. But I'm going to run because I'll mess it up. I know how not to start a fire. You don't put water on it, right? You, that's not a good idea. That's how you get rid of a fire, right? Um, so usually when we do bonfire stuff, I like get old people that know what they're doing, not me, because I can't control it. But they do, and they do a good job. But I know you don't put water on it. But he puts water on it three times over, and he calls out to God, and God sends fire down from heaven, burns up the altar, and burns up the water around it. Burns it up. Confident that God was there. Had the courage to stand before 450 prophets of Baal and say, my God is Yahweh. My God is the true God. Your God can't do nothing, and you can't do nothing to me either. Had the confidence there. Had the courage. Seemed like he had no fear. And God sends fire down, and after that he takes the 450 prophets and kills them by the sword. And the people around say, man, God is the true God. God is the true God. He's the true God. So he sends fire down. He kills the prophets. And then he turns to Ahab and says, it's time. Go eat and drink. The rain is coming. And so they're on Mount Carmel. And Ahab's eating and drinking. And, and Ahab, or, uh, Elijah lays down and prays and sends his servant over, over the mountain to look over the waters to see if there's a cloud. There's no cloud. He prays again. He prays a third time. And the servant goes up. And there's a cloud forming over the waters. And he's like, oh, yeah told you. Water's coming. And he says, Ahab, get on your chariot. I ain't never ridden on a chariot before. 
I'd like to, like, at some point before I die, but there's, they don't have those in Kingston, really. Um, I've ridden on a horse, though. When I was a kid one time, we had, like, a party at my grandma's house, and we were on a horse, and we used to have horses. And I know if you kick a horse, they go fast. And I did that when I was a kid, and I was super scared. Um, but, so I know horses are fast, faster than, like, a human. And, uh, but in this moment, he tells Reigns come, and he tells Ahab to get on his chariot. He gets on his chariot with four horses, and they're going down. And Ahab, the, the, the verse we first read, that the hand of the God was on Elijah, and Elijah ran, outran Ahab on the chariot. He was fired up. He said, man, God showed up. I brought fire down from heaven. I got rid of all the prophets of Baal. Things are going good. I'm about to bring rain. The people are saying that God is the true God. This is great. We did it. God's about to be back in this country. God's about to be back in, in Israel. People are going to bow down to him. People are going to forget about Baal because I've killed the prophets. It's time to go. Right? It's time to go. And he runs down and rain comes. He tells Ahab, go until the rain stops you, right? Or Ahab, the very next, very next verse, man, chapter 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do more to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid and he rose, arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself, when a day's journey in the wilderness, sat under a broom tree and asked God that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. How does he go from the mountaintop to this point in his life? He goes from a, a place where he's not afraid. He has the courage to stand up for what's right, stand up for uh, who God is in his life and allow God to show up in his life. And this woman says, I'm going to kill you, even though she's been trying to kill him for three years. And he runs away. He becomes afraid. He becomes afraid. Elijah is someone I think we can relate to, right? You ever got going in life and, and you're trying to do a project or trying to do something and in your mind it's going to work. In your mind you're going to get this done a certain way and then it just falls apart and it does not go how you thought it was going to go. Does that ever happen to y'all? No? Yeah, it happens to me a lot. Maybe I'm the only one. But it happens to me in my life. I, 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 like, I got a project to do or something and, and I want to do it and I, and I start learning about it. And I'm, I try to do things like confidently. Like if I'm going to do something, I'm going to at least act like I know what I'm doing, you know? And so uh, we have, uh, uh, me and my wife, we have a house, and uh, we have a home warranty on, on our appliances, and our refrigerator was messed up, so they kept coming out trying to fix it. They couldn't fix it, so they had to get us a new fridge. And uh, so the fridge came, and my wife was there. I was not there. I, was, I don't know where I was, but it got there, and it didn't fit under the, uh, under the cabinet. You know, it goes under the cabinet or whatever. It didn't fit. It just barely, it barely missed. So uh, Abby's calling me and it's like, hey, it's not fitting. Do you me call my dad? And I'm like, no, I'm a man, you know. I can do this. You know, so, so I'm like, no, no, I got it. Don't worry about it. I'll get it. And she sends me pictures. I'm like, it's just a little bit. Like, this should be easy, right? So I get home, and I'm like, all right. I'm looking at it. I'm like, oh, yeah, I can fix this. I can do it. So I go, and I go out to my garage, get some tools that somebody had left in my house probably. And, and I, get, I get back in the house, and I'm like, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sand the, the bottom of this cabinet just a little, and it's just going to slide right in, in my head. So I'm saying, I, I'm like, you know, going at it, like saying, like trying to get it to, get to, to move up a little bit so I can slide it in. And like trying to be a man, my wife's watching me. I'm like, it's embarrassing, but it's not working. I can't get it. So I'm doing this for like 45 minutes to an hour. And I'm like, all right, call your dad. <laughs> I'm done. I can't do it. I'm embarrassed. Like, dang, this, this is a lot harder than I thought it would be. So, so Mike, Mike makes his way. That's my father-in-law. He makes his way over to my house. And he gets there and he assesses the situation. And he brings tools because he has tools. And he didn't like my tools. Um, so I had a hammer, you know, and he needed, like, saws and stuff. So when he gets there, and, and he's looking at it, he's like, did you say you sanded this? And I said, yeah. And he was like, nothing's happened. Nothing's on here. Where's this, like, paint stuff from? I was like, and I looked down, and I, I quickly realized that I was trying to sand with a paint scraper. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so when, I got done, when I got done sanding, like, and it's not like a paint, like, it looked like a, whatever. In my mind, it was. <laughs> And so it's sitting there on the counter still, and, and he's looking at it, and, and I, he hadn't seen it, what I was using yet. I was like, oh, that's weird. And I grabbed it and just stuck it in my back pocket. <laughs> I'm like, he ain't seeing this. Like, this is embarrassing, you know? Like, embarrassed. Like, I was trying to be a manly man, and I'm like, trying to scrape paint off a cabinet. I don't even know. And my wife's like laughing at him, like, psh, psh, psh. you know, I like, don't tell him. And so he had to like saw it and get it in, like, and we put it in finally. It finally got in. But, but I went at this project thing, and I knew exactly what I was going to do. 
I knew how it was going to turn out. I was going to be, my, my, wife, my wife was going to be like, dang, I married a manly man, you know? Like, I was excited. And it did not turn out that way. It was like the exact opposite of what I thought it was going to be. And I think that's where, I think that's where Elijah was in this moment, right? He's been, he's been living for Christ, right? He's been living for God, doing what God called him to do. God has been providing for him left and right at every turn. God has been, been giving him what he needs. God's been uh, providing for him. God has uh, showed up when Elijah asked him to show up. God has been there. And he gets to this point on Mount Carmel where, where I think in Elijah's mind, he thought this was it. He thought this was the battle that was going to end it. He thought this was the battle that he was going to face and everything was going to go back the way it should be, to where everybody was worshiping God and living the right way and back to God. And, and he quickly realized that that's not how it turned out, right? He realized that he brought rain, man. He was like, it's, it's going to be good. People were saying, God is the true God. This is great. But that's not what happened. What happened was Jezebel got even more mad and said, I'm coming, and I'm going to kill you. And he got afraid. He let fear get the best of him. We get like that in life. We think we're doing good. We think we're doing what God's called us to do. We think we're on the right path uh, in ministry and life in general with your family. You feel like you're doing what God's called you to do. And then something doesn't turn out like you thought it should or something goes wrong. You lose somebody. Uh, something happens bad in ministry. Uh, one of your kids, your sons or daughters is going the wrong way. Your wife, your husband... Whatever it is, your job, you lose your job, something bad happens in your life, and you're ready to call it quits, man. You're ready to run. You're ready to run. We think we understand what's going on, and it just changes in a moment. When something doesn't go the way we think we should. Things don't go quite like we hoped. And we get in this valley, man. We get in this spiritual low place. We let fear get the best of us. Elijah gets afraid. If you're living for Jesus, if you're in here and you say, I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, that doesn't mean God's going to take the fear away. God's not going to take the fear away. We're, we have flesh. We're humans. We get afraid. Fear is a weird thing. We try to act like we don't get afraid a lot of times. Man, people get afraid. I get afraid. It's how you react to it. It's how you react to it. Faith in your life doesn't mean you won't have fear of what's to come. Faith... It's through, it's through that fear, knowing that the presence of God outweighs that fear. Knowing that through that fear, if you take a step out in faith, God's going to show up and overcome that fear. Whatever problem, whatever struggle, whatever sin, whatever uh, difficulty in your life that you're facing right now, the fear that you have in that situation of making that decision, we have to realize that God outweighs that fear. He's bigger than that fear. But life teaches us not to be afraid, right? We have to put on a strong face. Life teaches us to be comfortable, not take risks, to do, to do what's easy for us, to go through the motions, to try to keep everything that we have and not let it get away. But that's not, that's not what you're called to do, man. We get so worried about position, like, what's God called me to do? What, where, where has God called me? It messes us up, man. God has a purpose for your life. God has ordained steps for you. Fear keeps us from being public about our faith, about standing up for what's right. It keeps us from doing what God's called you to do from your purpose. What's God's purpose for you? In your life, in your life, God's purpose for you is not to show up on a Sunday morning, go to work the rest of the day or rest of the week, and then show back up next Sunday. I mean, God's purpose is so much bigger for that, bigger than that. God has a purpose specifically for you. we got different gifts, man. I can't get up and sing like JT does. But I've got different gifts. So do you. And God has given you those for his purpose, not for your own, not for your own. But that's what we want to think, right? That's what we want to think. We want to think about ourselves and, and, and where I want to be, where I want to get to, instead of thinking about where God wants you to get to. I heard a pastor say this, every Christian is a struggling Christian. I thought that was pretty good. I was thinking about that, and I was like, man, you, you, you try to live for Christ. You try to live holy like God's called you to live. You're going to have ups and downs. You're going to have difficulties in your life, and you're going to get in spiritual valleys where you're ready to call it quits, saying, I can't do this anymore. Take this away from me. Highs and lows, man. We get in valleys spiritually. 
people say I'm just dry or I don't know what's going on right now or man, I just I don't feel like doing church today. I don't feel like going to my meeting today. I don't feel like going to church tonight. I don't feel like coming this morning because I'm just struggling. I just I don't know what it is. I just feel off. I'm just in a funk. I just I, I don't know what's going on right now. See, some of you are like Elijah and you're running from what God's called you to do, and you don't even know you're running. You don't even know you're running from what God's called you to do. You don't even know it. We get to a place where we start running, man. Maybe God's called you to be a better husband, a better wife, a better father, a better mother, a better son or daughter. And we're running from it. We're running. I went through that, man. When I, I felt called in ministry when I was 17. I was 17. It was right before my senior year. I just turned 17. And, man, I was fired up in that moment. I was like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live for Jesus. I'm going to preach. And I'm excited. <clears throat> but that quickly changed, man. I started running. I decided that's not what I want to do. I don't want to be a preacher. They don't make any money. They don't, they got to go live different places. That's not what I want to do. I want to, I don't want to play basketball. I want to, I want to make a lot of money. I want to live where I want to live. I want to major in economics. I wanted to go to this school to do this. And, and I started running. I started running. I started running from what God was calling me to do. And I missed out on some opportunities. I missed out on different things. You start running. God has a plan for you, man. But we run out of courage to do what God's called us to do because it's, it's scary, right? It's scary to do what God's called you to do. Elijah had seen incredible things happen in his life. And then all of a sudden he ran. He ran. He said, it is enough, 1 Kings 19.4. He was ready to call it quits. But look, God brings him back. God loves him through it. And God will do you too. If you're in a valley this morning, so I asked you earlier to, to write down, where are you at spiritually? Think about that in your life. Like, where are you spiritually right now? Are you in a valley right now? Are you in a desert? Are you in a dry place in your life, in your relationship with Christ? What do you do? How do you get out of that? I got two things that I'm going to get through. I didn't do like 15 like Philip does. I got two, and I'm going to get you out on time. He was ready to call it quits, but God brings him back. First Kings 19. We're going to be in First Kings 19 the rest of the time, so you can follow along. Verse 5, he says, And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him, and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was, a he- there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and he drank and he lay down again. Verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and he ate and he drank and he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Mount Sinai, your Bible might say. The mountain of God. Some of us get in valleys in our walk with God. We get discouraged. We want to quit on our ministries. Nobody's showing up. Nobody's doing this. I'm trying and it's just not working. I've been coming to church and trying to get my family to come, but they just don't want to come. We're ready to call it quits, man. We're trying to quit what God's called you to do. We don't have the faith, man. We get in spiritually valleys, spiritual valleys because we don't feed our faith. So the first thing, you have to feed your faith. You have to feed your faith. Listen to this. Elijah was at his lowest. Elijah was ready to call it quits. He was ready to stop. He was ready for God to take his life. He was ready to, to not do anything else because he thought he had fought all the battles. He thought it was going to change, and it didn't. He was afraid. He lost courage. And what did God provide him? Food. To be strengthened. To get his strength back. Food. And just like Elijah, we have been given tools to feed our faith. We all have one of these right here. If you don't, I can give you one. If you have a phone, you have the Bible app on your phone. The Bible says Elijah woke up and the food was at his head. Most of you go to bed at night and you have your phone right there with you. You lay it on your nightstand right next to your head. It's the last thing you look at at night. It's the first thing you look at in the morning when you wake up. It's right there at your head. You get the Bible app on your phone. You got podcasts. You got uh, sermons that you can listen to. God has given you the tools to be fed spiritually. But we refuse to do it, right? We refuse to do it. God's given us podcasts, all kinds of stuff, man. Elijah didn't have that. Elijah didn't have the podcast of Moses of how he led the Israelites out of Egypt and how he got the Ten Commandments. You know, he didn't have that to listen to. But God had to give him physical strength, physical food. I eat terrible. I'm not a good eater. Um, I eat just, just not good. I eat late at night sometimes. And I'm trying, to, I'm trying to do better. And I have good intentions. Like, 
I put a workout bench in my room, and I haven't used it yet, but I put it in there. You know, in my mind, like, I'm going to use it. And, and I get on kicks where I'm going to start eating healthy, you know. Like, I'll, I'll buy lettuce and, like, other green things at the grocery store, and then they just sit in my refrigerator until we throw them away, and Abby gets mad at me. But, I, like, I have good intentions, and I want to eat good, right? I'm trying to get back and play in weight because now I'm, like, a center in basketball, and I used to be a guard. I've just got gained some weight, you know, so I post people up now. But I'm, so I'm trying to get back. I'm trying to eat better, trying to do better. And, and, and I, in my mind, that's what I'm going to do. And then uh, Abby will cook something, or I'll have something prepared on Friday, and I'm like, all right, I'm eating good because Friday I'm off, so I'm like excited. Friday's going to be my day. I'm going to eat good. I'm going to have a salad for lunch. It's going to be great, or like a sandwich. Like, it's going to be good. I'm going to do good. And then Abby will text me like, hey, what would you eat for lunch today? And I'm always so ashamed when I say uh, popcorn, a waffle, and uh, Pepsi, you know, because that, that's how I eat, you know. That's just what I do. And y'all are laughing at me, but y'all do the same thing. Y'all might not eat popcorn and waffles, but we do it spiritually. Right? God's given you the tools to feed yourself spiritually, and we refuse to do it. We really get on Netflix or, or watch TV or get on YouTube or get on the computer or get on Instagram, get on Twitter, get on Facebook. We do those instead of feeding ourselves spiritually when God's given us the tools to do it. Maybe you're in a valley right now. You're in a valley. You're running from what God's called you to do. You haven't been living your life right spiritually. You haven't been doing what God has called you to do. And maybe you're in here and you don't even know you're running from it. You don't even know just because you're so dry spiritually because you haven't been in the Word. You haven't been uh, doing what God's called you to do. And, and He's given us the tools to do it. When, is that, when I was at my worst, when I was uh, probably in my lowest valley spiritually, it was, I was uh, pretty early on in my college days and uh, I'd been struggling and, and just not making wise decisions, doing bad things. And I remember getting to a place in my life and I was like, what am I doing? Like, why, why am I living this way? Why am I acting like this? And I felt like I didn't have anybody to talk to, and I didn't know who to talk to, and I didn't know what to do. So it was the first time I ever read my Bible all the way through. Like, it was in college, and I was like, I, I got to figure something out. So I was like, maybe I can fix my relationship with, with God. Like, so I started reading. And as I was reading, I was, I was soaking it in, right? At the time, I was just trying to do anything to grasp to get my life back to where God's called me to, 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 to live, right? What God, my purpose for God, for, that God's called me to. And so I start reading, and I'm trying to soak it in, I'm trying to try to figure it out, and then slowly but surely, my life started changing, right? Because he's given us the tools, right? He's given us the tools, but we refuse to use it. And when we use it, when you're in a spiritually valley, spiritual valley in your life, you're feeding your faith. I had the faith, right? I had Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, but I was not living the way God called me to live. And so I started feeding my faith with the Word of God and with prayer with God, and my life started to change. And I forget this, I think I've shared this before, but uh, I got a call a little less than a year ago from a guy. I got my life back together, and I, my first job in ministry ever, I was in Nashville, and I got a call less than a year ago from a guy that um, I had invited to church camp when I was doing ministry, and he got saved. <clears throat> and we got to baptize him. I remember it. Like, I remember baptizing him. And, and we were so excited, and I was fired up. And that, this the last time I saw him that summer. You know, I, he went his way, and I went my way. I came up here. I got a call less than a year ago, and he had led his first uh, kid to Christ and actually got to baptize him in a college ministry. And if I would have never got out of the valley, if I would have never got out of my spiritual valley, I may never have led that guy to Jesus. I may have never showed him who Jesus Christ is. And if I would have never done that, maybe he never got into ministry and did what he did and led that kid to Christ. you got to get out of the valley. You don't know the impact that you're missing by being in the valley. Feed your faith. He's given us the tools. Feed your faith. We pray for things like, God, give me courage. God, take this fear away. God, give me the peace in this situation. If God took your, cur took your fear away all the time and just gave you courage every time you asked for it, you would never rely on God for nothing, man. God's given you the faith. He said, I've already given you the faith. Feed your faith, and you'll overcome this fear. Feed your faith, and you'll have the courage. Feed your faith, and you'll be able to make this decision. Feed your faith, and you'll be a better leader. Feed your faith. Feed your faith, man. So Elijah gets fed twice, and he gets to the mountain of God. Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, same mountain that Moses got the Ten Commandments and uh, the law and led the Israelites out of. And that's where God showed his glory to the Israelites after they got out of Egypt. The fire came down and the, the cloud came down to show God's glory to the Israelites. And so he gets there. 1 Kings chapter nine or chapter 19, verse 9. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very zealous for you, Lord, the God of the hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your uh, altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. 
and they seek my life to take it away. They seek my life to take it away. God asks them, what are you doing here? And, and, and for me, I, we relate to this a lot, a lot more than you think of. Elijah was doing incredible things for God, right? He was on Mount Carmel, brought fire down from heaven at his command. Raised the guy from the dead, had ravens feed him. Was doing incredible for God. And all of a sudden he gets in this valley. He was doing awesome things for God. And he gets in this valley and he becomes selfish. He makes it about himself. And follow me, listen to me. We go through stuff and we're doing things for, for Christ and we're in ministry and things are going great. Man, it's, man God, is, God is good. God is doing good things in our life. God is doing good things in this church. Man, we're seeing salvation. <clears throat> we're seeing baptism. Man, God has his hand all over this place. And then you get in a spiritual valley and you make it all about yourself. Man, I'm just dry. Man, I just, I just, I don't, I don't feel the same way I used to. Man, I, I just, I, I'm not feeling it. Man, I, I don't know, I don't know what, I, what else I can do. I don't know what else I need to do. You make it about yourself. That's what Elijah's doing. He said, I'm the only one left. We know that's not true. We know that's not true. But he says, I'm the only one left. I don't know, I don't know what else to do. He didn't see the big picture. He saw his moment, his valley, what he was in. When we make it about ourselves, man, you're running from what God's called you to do. We make it about ourselves. He goes on in verse 11, he says, And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. So Elijah was in this valley. He gets fed. He feeds his faith. He gets strengthened because of the food that God gave him. And God brings him back to the presence of God, right? He brings him back on the mountain. So for you, if you're in your valley, you've got to feed your faith. And when you feed your faith, you know what happens? You start getting right with God. You get, you get back in the presence of God and what God's called you to do. He's on a Mount, Mount Carmel. He comes down in a valley, weak, afraid, discouraged. God feeds him, and he comes back to the mountain. A different mountain, but he comes back to the mountain of God. And listen to this. He, the, he comes, the, there's a wind, right? A strong wind. Y'all have seen powerful storms. The wind's going. The trees are turned sideways. It's powerful. I've never been part of an earthquake, but people have been part of an earthquake. It's, it's scary. It's powerful. The earth, the earth shakes. And the fire comes down. It's powerful. Fire's powerful. We, get, we come to church and we sing a song and you get goosebumps, right? You hear uh, a message and you go, whew, man, God's here today. You know, that was God right there. You got to see wind and earthquake and fire. Like God is there. I think God had to remind him the power that he had, right? God had to remind him, hey, listen, I'm here. I never left. I think that's where we get to. God never leaves you. God didn't leave. You left. You started running. You started doing the exact opposite of what God called you to do. God's still there waiting on you. And he brings you back by feeding your faith, man. So he brings him back and he gives him the tools to restore Elijah's strength and courage. It reminds you of who God, who God is. It reminds you of who God is. God reminded him with wind and fire and earthquake, but God decided to get his attention with a whisper, with a low whisper. Verse 13, he says, in, in the whisper, And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak. And he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Asked him again, What are you doing here, Elijah? In a low whisper, gets his attention. When he hears God's voice, it's cool. In that moment, he covers his face, right? He, he takes his cloak, covers his face. He didn't do that when the wind came. He didn't do that when the earthquake happened. He didn't do that when the fire came down. He did it when he heard the whisper of God. Old Testament teaches that, that uh, when you see the presence of God, uh, if you look face to face with it, uh, you'll die, right? Uh, Moses got to see the back of God, and his face was glowing, right? So he was afraid. He heard God's voice, and he covered his face. Covered his face. That's what got him the low whisper. And God was getting his attention, saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? I'm asking this, what are you doing here? Why are you in the spiritual valley right now? Why are you running? What are you running from, Elijah? Have I not been with you every step of the way? Have I not provided for you every turn? Have I not brought fire down at your command? 
Have I not raised the kid from the dead when you prayed and asked me? Have I not provided the food from the ravens? Have I not kept you alive during the drought and from Jezebel? What are you doing here? Elijah? I think at that moment, he's like, who? I don't know. You know? He gives the same answer. Elijah replies and he says, I have been zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel, Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. They seek my life to take it away. And God says, go back. Turn around. Go back to the, to the wilderness of Damascus. I'm not done with you yet. I'm not done with you yet. I'm not done. There's still work to be done. There's still work to be done. Second thing, when you're in a valley, when you're in a spiritual valley, you're in a spiritual low in your life and, and you don't know how you're going to get out of it, one, you've got to feed your faith and you've got to realize that there's breath still in your lung. There's still work to be done. That God still has a purpose for your life, meaning for your life, and it's up to you to say, all right, I'm going to feed my faith and I'm going to walk in it. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. I'm going to stop running. I'm going to stop being afraid. I'm going to stop, stop losing courage. And I'm going to do what God's called me to do because there's still work to be done. I want you to get this. He, he leaves from one mountaintop, Mount Carmel, where he does something incredible for God. The next instant, he's in a valley, in the desert, in a dry spot. He had to feed his faith, man. He had to grow spiritually. He had to, he had to uh, be strengthened by the food that God gave him. When you're in a spiritual valley, you've got to feed your faith. You've got to grow spiritually. You've got to get in the Word. You've got to fix your relationship. You've got to pray to God. And God is going to bring you back on the mountain to get you back to where He wants you to be. I don't know what you're running from this morning. I don't know how far you run. It don't matter how far you run, where you've run to. God can bring you right back. But you have to feed your faith. And you have to remember, there's still work to be done. The presence of the Lord passed by Elijah. It's a pretty cool uh, a moment in Elijah's life to where God finally showed him the bigger picture, and we'll get to that in a second, of what's still to come. He said, I'm not done with you yet. There's still work to be done. He had more miracles to perform. I told you he performed 14. He'd only performed a few so far. He had more to perform. He gives him the big picture. See, the presence of God's not going to come to you like he does Elijah, but if you know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you have the Spirit of the Lord that lives inside of you. And when you feed your faith, when you grow spiritually, the Spirit of the Lord is going to grow in you. And that's what's going to come out and get you back on the mountain and doing what God's called you to do. JT, you guys go and come back up. God showed Elijah the big picture. We, man, we struggle at seeing the big picture of your life. You struggle at seeing what God's called you to do. You see in the moment, you don't think about the future and really where God's called you. He told him the plans. The Bible continues and he says, Go and return on your way, in verse 15, to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint uh, Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, son of Nishmi, to, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of uh, Abel, Melahal, uh, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes the sword of Haziel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Elijah didn't realize that he wasn't the only one. Elijah was in the valley, made it about himself, became selfish. But he wasn't the only one. He didn't know that Elisha was right on the corner. And if you know anything about Elisha, Elijah performed 14 miracles. Elisha performed double of that. Elisha would have never been called by God if it weren't for Elijah. If Elijah would have just given up, thrown in the towel, said, I'm not getting back into the game. I'm not going back to what God's called me to do. He would have never met Elisha. He would have never called Elisha. He would have never had Elisha do what Elisha did. God wasn't done with Elijah. But he was ready to call it quits. God's not done with you yet. If you're in a spiritual valley right now, listen, I'm telling you, God still has a plan for you. He still has a purpose for you. And it's time to feed your faith and get back in the game. It's time to get back and stop running from whatever it is you're running from. Whatever sin that's crept up in your life, whatever relationship you're running from, whatever uh, decision you're running from, whatever moment you're running from, whatever fear you're running from. It's time to feed your faith and get back at it because there's still work to be done. There's still work to be done. 
Elijah didn't know Elisha was right around the corner. He didn't know. I don't know what you have going on in your life right now. I don't, I don't know where you're at spiritually. I told you to write that question down. Where are you at spiritually right now? You may be on a mountain. You've heard a preacher probably say this before you either. In a storm, coming out of a storm, about to head into a storm. Maybe you're about to head in a storm and you're running from the storm, right? You don't want to go in the storm, so you're running. Whether you're on a mountain right now, thinking you're living for Christ, doing what God's called you to do, in an instant you can be in a valley. You can be in a spiritual dry place. And if you're in a spiritual dry place right now and you're in a valley, you've got to feed your faith. He's given us the tools, man. When you start feeding your faith, you've got to get back in the game. Because listen, there's still work to be done. We sing that song, there's breath in our lungs. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. God has given you your breath. He didn't give you your breath so you can attain a certain position, get to a certain place in your life, do what you want to do. He gave you that breath so you could worship Him, praise Him, and do what He's called you to do. Do what He's called you to do. What are you running from? Let's have the courage to get back in the game. There's a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. It's time to feed your faith and get back at it. It's time to get out of the valley, get back on the mountain, and do what God's called you to do. Whatever that is for your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much just for who you are. Thank you for just allowing us to come together this morning to worship and, and dive into your word. Thank you for giving people in, the, in Scripture like Elijah who was on a spiritual high for, for so long and confident in what you were doing in his life, but in an instant we got to see that he was in a valley, man. He was in a, he was in a desert. He was in a dry place in his life, and he was ready to call it quits. And maybe that's someone in here tonight, Lord, and they're ready to call it quits. They're saying, I've tried. I've done everything I can do. I, I, I'm trying to come to church. I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to uh, get better. I'm trying to stop this addiction. I'm trying to uh, stop this sin in my life. I'm trying. But I don't know what else to do. I'm ready to quit. Listen, God is not done with you yet. I pray that as we're in here, if we're in a spiritually low place in our life, I pray that we can have the courage to overcome it, that we can have the courage to feed our faith, to grow closer to you, to realize it's not about ourselves, but it's about the kingdom of God, that we're only here for, for a little bit and we know we're going to be in eternity worshiping you forever. And that while we're here on this earth, you've given us breath, you've given us life. It is our mission to serve you. It's our mission to get back on the mountain, get back in the game and, and tell people about who you are and how good you are, God. Lord, we thank you for who you are and what you've done in our lives.